proximity and see if that works. <laughs> Thank you for coming today to um, uh, talk with us and think about this really um, ongoing, say an emergent uh, issue, this ongoing issue um, in our country. We are the folks, particularly with school gun violence, who are on the front lines, and I wanted to start off saying we can make a difference. And today we're going to talk about uh, some of the um, antecedents, we'll, we'll frame the problem a little bit. Um, I'm going to talk about some um, uh, prevention uh, um, approaches and strategies. Um, and then, uh, I'm, I'm Steve Notek, I'm the coordinator of the school psych program. Uh, Dr. Evers, who is one of our faculty as well, is going to talk about postvention. And this is after the awful, unspeakable things happen. There are some things that we can do to go in and <coughs> provide some psychological first aid to kind of help contain the psychological uh, piece and contagion from, from this uh, unfortunate topic. Um, so I'm going to get started. And I have to start by saying, does anybody look at the news in the last 20 minutes? Yeah. 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 All right. No. Yeah. OK, so there's a shooting in, um, in yeah. Maryland. Um, a student apparently uh, entered the school, started shooting. The s school shooter is dead. One of the people who shot is dead. The um, uh, community officer shot and killed the um, shooter. You know, um, we're going to talk about media a little bit and just briefly touch on it. But um, there's this idea of the contagion effect. Uh, we can expect a rough couple of months. Um, <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to talk about the context of the problem in schools, but gun violence is a particularly, for industrial nations, is particularly an American issue. Um, and we're going to talk about, um, in another uh, seminar or panel we're going to have, probably in two, three weeks, about gun violence in communities and how that impacts our students. All right, so this is the sad, ugly truth. Since Sandy Hook, not including Sandy Hook, 7,000 uh, children in America have died from gun violence. 9-11, what, 2,500 Americans died? Okay, this is 7,000 in the last five or so years. This is a picture, uh, there was recently, with all the things that have gone on um, with mass shootings, there was um, a march in Washington. They had 7,000 pairs of shoes that were out, spread out in front of the Capitol. Um, boy, it's a really powerful way to get a sense of the magnitude of what we're dealing with. Before I talk more about the daily gun violence, which is an awful thing, but we have uh, we have entire areas of academic and um, uh, police study on this issue. I want to tell you a bit about my background. I've been working as a school psychologist and counselor in communities for about 30 years. Um, this problem is not new. It was there 30 years ago. It's gotten worse. Um, in my experience working in community mental health in San Francisco, um, I was working with kids from the war zone in Central America, and I was working with um, inner city, predominantly African American youth. Mm -hmm. My African American youth, these folks who I was working with, had had more first order relatives killed by gun violence than my students who were refugees from the war zone. All right? um, I've had the, uh, the unfortunate task of having to help provide crisis intervention for school shootings, um, hurricanes, earthquakes, and things. Those tend to be more manageable, but it's the um, gun violence, it's the school and few shootings that tend to have the most um, uh, detrimental impacts on kids, and we'll, we'll talk about some of that uh, as we go forward. All right, so looking at, this is from the um, Brady uh, campaign against um, uh, gun violence. They're, they're great uh, resource. Okay, um, from the ages zero to 19, every day, seven kids in America die from gun violence. Um, 46 are actually shot, and of the kids who were shot and survived, um, 31 are injured, eight are shot unintentionally, guns are everywhere, right? So that's one of the things I'm gonna be saying for the last couple minutes, guns are everywhere. You know this? And we're not going to take an anti-gun, not pro-gun for sure, 
um, approach, we found from the psychological uh, research and perspective, we need to focus on people who shouldn't have guns, having guns and using them in inappropriately. That's how we can design our interventions in school settings anyway. Annual gun violence. Oh my gosh, 17,000 kids <coughs> are shot in murders, assaults, suicides. Um, almost 3,000 kids die from gun violence every year. So that's almost uh, 15, well, more than 1,500 are, are, are murdered. You know, it's the um, suicide piece. So, you know, again, this is unfortunately a uniquely American problem. And it's something in schools, obviously, that we need to be really thoughtful about addressing. How can we move forward with this? I want to show you the uh, summary of school gun violence in the last, um, since 2014. This is the New York Times has a uh, wonderful graphic. That, um, it's a graphic that, all right, so this graphic here, this um, shows the unrelenting nature of um, gun violence and mass shootings in the United States over the last, uh, this is just the last five years. Okay. Pretty off. So there have been about 240 shootings nationwide, about 440 people were shot, 140 were killed. Today we can add more to that list. Um, 16 though, of these 239 were classified as mass shootings, where greater than four people were shot, not even less than four, but four or greater is where we had to count them. And on average, there's about five school shootings a month. All right, so we're reciting this unfortunate litany of, of concern. But there's this paradoxical caution that we need to talk about. Schools are a relatively safe place for kids to be related to gun violence. We're going to talk about why this statistic is, why this fact is important in, in a minute, and how we, how we respond to things. 1% uh, of school age homicides occurs in schools, and depending on, on who does the uh, numbers, in an average school, there might be one homicide every 6,000 years. Now, that's comforting, that's not comforting, one shooting is too many. What we know though, and this is what we're really, um, gun violence outside of schools are more prevalent, right? Not so much media attention. This is the day in, the day out of kids, and particularly in um, inner city communities, uh, when they hear a gunshot, boom, they're underneath the desk, right? Um, and then there's, the gun violence in schools, which is less prevalent, but there is a huge increase in media. Both of these issues are important, and we're going to be covering both of these um, over our, our time together uh, today and, and hopefully in a couple weeks. And then next year as well, we're looking at doing some ongoing training and support to really give um, teachers and counselors in our school psychs um, an expanded skill set to be able to really think about and manage this work. Even though the likelihood of gun violence at any given school, it's, a, it's actually, it's, it's pretty low. And it's comforting, but it's crazy that we even have to use that, that we're thinking about it. The cycle of our school toll on uh, students, on teachers, on families is immense, particularly given what we know about um, how things spread with the media, the 24-7 coverage, what kids hear, what kids don't hear. Um, the psychological toll is something that we really need to attend to. Uh, my family, my kids went to school here in Chapel Hill. At the elementary school that my son went to, uh, I think this was fourth grade, there was a school-involved shooting where uh, there was um, a woman waiting in line in the after-school line. Um, she was trapped. Her ex-husband came, shot her. And my son and his class heard, they, were, they had the window overlooking the parking lot, they looked down and the substitute teacher didn't know what to do, so he had them all go in the closet. And the kids were in the closet. Finally, uh, the police came, let the kids out. What do you think the school's response, sh well, I would like to say, my expectation that the school's response would have been, uh, they checked in with the kids. We, uh, Dr. Evers is gonna give you um, uh, the outlines of this great post-venture model. None of that happened. So in our neighborhood, Kids were not wanting to go to school. They were worried about safety, all kinds of dreams. 
Um, people in the neighborhood know my wife and I are psychologists. We're getting all these phone calls. So finally, we started. We didn't want to go in and tell the principal what to do, but we started sending tons of resources her way to mobilize her. And that's here in Chapel Hill, right? So we think about other places where perhaps they don't have our, our, our resources or the frequency of our gun violence. And um, you can imagine how difficult it is for kids. There was, um, at my kids' middle school, there was a gun involved shooting where um, an employee was accosted by her husband and also shot. This is at the middle school, right? So this is, this is happening everywhere. This is, a, in some ways, a bleak picture, but it's also, here's the paradox, it's not going to happen to most people most of the time. We need to be aware of that because there are unintended consequences with fears of school shootings. And for those of us who uh, think about crisis intervention and response, we want to be sure that we target areas that, are, um, that need to be targeted and we don't have unintended consequences. In this case, these are some of the things that um, Cornell, he's this guy at um, Virginia, he's got a program we're going to be talking about in a minute. He's kind of the, the, the hard guru of this stuff. One of the consequences is the diversion of funds to unproven school security measures. So what are some of the things that, that we've heard coming out of Washington about how to protect schools? Off the top of your head, can you think of a couple? Armed teachers. teachers. Hard <laughs> school sites um, have bulletproof doors. Um, hardy windows, all right? Um, that may or may not be effective. The, the one of the things we're going to be talking about today is we don't know what the research is on this. We just don't know. So, uh, and what do we know about education funding? Boy, it's taking off like a rocket. Oh, no, it's coming down, isn't it? right? So this is a critical issue. And if we're talking about, if we know that um, certain kinds of education programs can help um, kids not go down that kind of dark path, oof. This is not a way that we want to be going. Previous response plans. Okay, so if you really want to prime a kid to be fearful, give them um, a bulletproof backpack. Um, do overly graphic active shooter drills. Okay, that person's coming, you all run in. Ah, you're screaming, you close the door. Um, in my experience, just as, as a parent, my kids have had some teachers who handled this very well. They've had some, some teachers who themselves are so nervous and hadn't had the kind of training and preparation to think about the kids' developmental needs, their own psychological vulnerability, that it was really toxic. Most of our kids, most of the time, are not going to be shot. But if we create this expectation of it, um, that's going to have really unfortunate um, long-term consequences. Right? And this is where oh boy, um, uh, social justice issues really come to the fore. Generalizing student misbehavior. We're going to look at the, um, some of the characteristics and qualities of, of who these um, uh, mass shooters are on school settings. As we talk about now criminalizing student misbehavior, using law enforcement officers for behavior management, et cetera, which, you know, which segments of our society are going to be targeted for the most part in school settings? Males. Yeah, yeah, black males, or students of color, right? These mostly are not the kids who were doing the um, mass shootings. But they're the ones who are going to bear the brunt of really not well thought out. Um, and if you go and look at some of the uh, um, comments, which I, I've done, I don't mean to do it, but I look at them on some of the um, news articles about uh, like restorative justice and some of those things. Um, Obama did this to us. Um, look at you liberal pinko lefties. Um, but these are the kids who are being targeted, and they're not the folks who are pulling the trigger, right? Zero tolerance is <coughs> I think all of us in this room share some concerns about that. Um, disproportionately, disproportionately affecting uh, students of color, and then this just reinforces the school to prison pipeline. So we're going to talk about prevention, early intervention, and um, keeping kids off this downward path. These things actively go against that. Yet these are some of the um, knee-jerk responses that people who are, who are understandably scared, we all care about our kids, I want to say that. We all care about our kids, right? But we have to be careful and we need to advocate for what we know um, works and what doesn't work and what needs more research. Okay, any comments about this so far? 
It's not, it's not all going to be this doom and gloom, right? We're going to talk about some, some, some ways to move forward. Oops. All right, so how, who are these school shooters? Well, we talked about the zero tolerance policies and um, the criminalization <coughs> of uh, behavior of kids. Let's see if the students of color are in this. Okay. Um, often these things, these shootings occur in low crime rural towns or suburbs. Generally, not all the time, but generally white adolescent male. The tricky thing is often these kids ha don't have disciplinary problems. Now, some do. We're going to talk about the Florida situation, but often there's a little history of disciplinary problems. The mass shooters are often average or better than average students. They may have had signs of early stage mental illness, depression, suicidality, uh, su suicidality um, and we're going to talk about why, in some ways, that's meaningless. Anybody um, ever met a teenager who wasn't moody? <laughs> no. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. Um, all right. So these guys are socially marginalized. Um, they're influenced, encouraged by others to attack. This is important because this is the way that we can move forward. Um, they had manifest interest in guns and killing people. And we're really starting to look at, we don't want to have an injured reaction to ban all media, uh, but it looks like there's uh, media which is influencing uh, this stuff. Okay, so what we know about these shooters, there's a confluence of individual, family, school, peer, community, and social cultural issues. Most of the kids who share some of these, um, well, not all kids who share these issues become shooters. Um, early mental, uh, mental illness, we're, we're going to keep the uh, guns away from, out, from folks who have mental illness. That's like 20% of the population. That's not going to happen, right? All right, so we want to be thinking about risk and protective factors. And I don't want to make this too academic, but we need to know these things so that we can think about how can we intervene? What programs can we make that are going to be um, impactful and, and can make a difference? So there are things like access to gun and uh, media violence. Um, there's this thing called the dark triad. These are the uh, kids who don't, for sure don't want to have weapons. But then there's protective self-regulation, social confidence, <coughs> effective parenting. We can support parents on um, managing on um, ways to express and manage uh, anger and um, some other kinds of issues there. So I want to talk briefly about prevention networks, right? So we're not hopeless. One is we can um, identify, provide mental health treatment to people in need. Um, since the um, incident in Florida, there has been a lot of um, press about um, the number of school psychologists, school social workers, and school counselors. One to 2,000 um, is, is typical. Um, we know where these kids are. Um, our country doesn't have a unified mental health system. It's spotty depending on where you're from. You may or you may, or you may not get it. Um, but we know that early intervention and support can really keep, uh, can, can help a kid going like this, go like this, or at least, you know, stay stable. And then there's this thing that you can be hearing a lot about behavioral threat assessments in the um, news. It focuses on prevention, intervention, but then also comprehensive responses. And this is different from profiling. In profiling, we take some characteristics, like the things that I threw up earlier. We take those and say, we're going to get every kid like this, and we're going to keep them away from guns, and we're just, and we're just going to worry over them. It turns out that that's too heterogeneous. It's not useful. It doesn't help us reach these kids, and it doesn't help us intervene before these kids have issues. So there are some. Um, in the uh, Virginia model, there's um, early attention to school conflict, student conflict, bullying, teasing, school climate issues, um, a flexible approach to problem solving, multidisciplinary teams, intervention monitoring. So th there's a lot of good stuff in here. We're going to send you uh, the um, link to this PowerPoint, and you're going to be able to, to look at these things. Also, next year, we, we want to provide some more in-depth kind of support for you. But this takes us to the shooting in Florida. I want to show what we know about this kid and then some things I just told you about prevention. All right? 
All right, so this is based on, new, on uh, news reports, and I uh, list them at the bottom. So psychological behavioral, he had a bunch of psych, uh, psychiatric diagnoses. Moody, impulsive, for self regulation attention to pet motors, harm to self, professional school shooter on his Facebook page. Harm to animals, destruction of property, bullying, oh my gosh. Um, not one of these things is good, right? In terms of um, not, not being worried, this constellation, of them is really, really worrisome. But what did the school do? I've heard lots of, uh, lots of stones have been thrown at the school and the school board. But what did they do? Well, they did something called the Baker Act uh, Psychiatric Evaluation, where you can, um, after doing, a, a, if somebody is uh, harmed, uh, uh, harmed yourself, harmed others, and has some other things going on, they have access to a firearm, you can commit them involuntarily for three days. If you're taking away their civil rights for 72 hours, right? So it's kind of a um, high bar. They started the process with this kid with the deputy who didn't go into the school. This is the same deputy who uh, school counselors and psychologists didn't have the authority to um, uh, recommend um, following through with the Baker Act. This deputy decided that oh, there's not enough there. We know this deputy is not a mental health expert, but he was the one who made the call. If the kid had been seen, there would be there would have been some barriers to him buying this weapon the way he did. Didn't mean he wouldn't have gotten it, but it would have been more difficult. They had a threat assessment and a related safety plan for this kid. They were on it. They were worried about this kid forever. They had done they had done the work, but then um, because he was classified, he was a special ed kid. When he turned uh, 18, he said, "Nope, I don't want that anymore." So the school. This, this safety plan didn't count anymore. The school couldn't control them, so they sent them instead to this um, uh, uh, online learning drop-up adventure program where he wasn't harm, harmful to the kids who were, who were in the center, but um, he was not receiving any kind of care or treatment. There were all kinds of special ed uh, services he got. He went to a school for emotionally disturbed kids at only big, uh, wealthy uh, counties have. So the schools did not do things. They did lots. What I want to say to you, though, is that um, there was, they talk about breakdowns. This is a complicated case. Teachers, especially, have the capacity to be the ones who are relentless in making sure the kids get, get support. Well, I worked in community mouth mental health in San Francisco. It wasn't the school psychologists who were bringing teachers to our treatment center. It was the teachers piling the kids in their car, driving them on their own nickel after work and saying, this kid's hearing things and has heard the tree telling her to shoot somebody. All right? So we have procedures in place. We need more research on how to make it more unified. Uh, we need to think about gun access. We need to think about media violence. But I am telling you that you all have the capacity to make a difference. This is a game changer, I think, potentially. Um, I'm assuming you all saw these amazing kids um, giving these talks. And uh, right to own guns and have as many guns as you want in state like Florida. They've made some changes that are minuscule, but against the tide of, of runaway gun use, they pulled back a bit. This is these kids in a matter of three weeks. It's amazing. So. What does that mean for us? It means that um, we do have avenues to move forward with public policy, thinking about gun access, about mental health issues. This, the, the, the time we think is now, there's never been, um, frankly, more potent speakers than we've got now. It's our kids, the kids that we have work with. Um, we don't want to do the um, whitewashed liberal media thing. That's not what we're saying. This is a public health problem. And these students are the ones who are, I think, going to be able to help people hear this, that this is a public health problem, that they are concerned. Okay. Um, Dr. Evers now is going to talk about postvention. So uh, this stuff happens. We couldn't prevent it. This stuff happens. What do we do next? Again, this is hopeful. Out of the, out of the ashes, there are ways that we can support other kids and we can contain the kind of fallout.
All right, so thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to switch gears quite a bit. We're going to talk about post nope, postvention. <laughs> That's part of the beginning of the show. Um, we're going to talk about postvention, and this was very difficult for me to actually figure out how to do in 30 minutes. This is something I usually do for days that I present and provide workshops for. Um, so we're going to talk about crisis postvention. This is really important um, maybe to even start with the PREPARE model. The PREPARE model is the most commonly used model that schools use. Does it sound like Chapel Hill uses it? Um, I offered, they dropped, they, even for free, um, and I couldn't get in. Um, <laughs> but uh, the PREPARE model is based off of the National Association of School Psychologists. It's also in conjunction with FEMA, the National NIMS, the National Incident Management System, Homeland Security, and the U.S. Department of Public Education. So it's very comprehensive. It follows the same guidelines that all of these other first responders are actually doing. Uh, so we use the same language. We know that it's very important that we're not wasting any time, any minute. We don't want any redundancy of efforts. Um, so if we are using the same language of incident commander and who is in charge, who is the communication coordinator, we will not have the redundancy and we will also um, be able to deal with and be as effective as we can. Um, so the PREPARE model, I'm just, again, I'm not going to be able to cover all of it, um, but the very, one of the most important parts is the prevent and prepare. So this is the bulk of the first workshop I actually give. And this is where we need to have the most comprehensive plan. Um, NCLB, the reauthorization, we have ESSA, and that has required us to all, every school in school district has to have a crisis plan. It does not stipulate how good that plan is. Does it just have tornado drills, fire drills, an occasional lockdown, secured perimeter? It does not actually look at all of the things prior, the vulnerability assessments, um, crime prevention through environmental design, which is essentially um, decreasing the opportunity for crime and also increasing the idea of this place is risky. I'm not gonna get very far going into this particular school. Okay, so those are some other key concepts I could talk about. Um, the next is, um, the workshops. And the reason I wanna just mention these two workshops is because I know there are a lot of professors in here. If you ever want me to come and consult, talk to your class about certain parts of this, for, that would be applicable to your program. Administration is going to, of course, be different than teachers and early childhood versus high school. Um, I'd be more than happy to do that, or at least to have the first conversations. Um, so this first part is actually a full day of um, a workshop, so that's why it's hard to distill this day down. Um, the intervention recovery, this is for uh, social workers, counselors, and psychologists, and this is providing that psychological first aid. Uh, but the problem here is, is that it is not truly just for them because anyone that works in a school, you all know you wear a psychology hat at some point, you are a counselor at some point, no matter what you do. If you're in a school, you're doing that. Uh, so it can be helpful for everyone. All right, so I'm going to go through the first steps and then a few of the others, and then if we get to it, the final steps, talking about memorials and some of the just common rules of what we should be doing. <coughs> all right. So the very first thing we do is look at, uh, we have taken the individuals, the, the students, and now we are in a lockdown. Um, it may be a soft lockdown, a hard lockdown, but we're in that situation. Let's imagine we have our classroom and we're in the bathroom with these kids, the lights are off, we're quiet, we're sitting there and waiting. So we've avoided that physical harm, but now we need to avoid additional emotional harm. Okay, so they're already emotional, they're gonna be worried, but we need to make sure that we can get them out of that situation when the time is right and we're told to by first responders. What do we do? How do we, what is the path that we take? And so this is, of course, a team decision. Um, and first responders, when they come on site, they're going to be the incident commander, not the principal. They're underneath that incident commander. That's why this language is very important. Um, but we need to make sure that we take them out of the school and into an environment, into a setting in which they will not see or hear, smell, taste, any of those things that could actually increase their emotional trauma. 
So if that means you have to go up the stairs to the second floor, out and through the cafeteria and out to the field, if that's going to help you avoid seeing anything, that is what we need to do, okay? Uh, let's see. Yeah, so this, this is a picture. Anyone recognize what this picture is from? Sandy Hook. Sandy Hook. Okay, so Sandy Hook, um, I'm really impressed with how a lot of schools are actually responding. They're using a lot of these concepts. What they did with Sandy Hook is with these small children, they had them put their hands on the shoulders of the person in front of them. They told them to close their eyes. And even some of the teachers with the really young kids asked them to sing a song. So they like led them in songs so they couldn't hear everything else and the helicopters and <coughs> is avoiding as much emotional harm as possible. Okay. So you can actually do a lot just with that. Um, the next is reaffirming health and safety. So once we have these children, let's say out of the lockdown and now they're in the field where they're going to have a reunification with their parents. Uh, we need to make sure that we have, actually this is a, a picture of a reunification plan. So this is the preparation. We need to make sure we know how to have these kids go back to their parents or their caregivers. And we need to have them in separate places, not just a free for all, going into the school and, and being very concerned. That reunification plan is key because as <coughs> teachers and those on the crisis team, we need to be able to go and talk to the parent, tell them your, re your first reaction is going to be very important. They may not have thought this was as dangerous, their threat perception wasn't that great, but when you react that way, they're gonna be like, oh, I, maybe I should have been a little bit more scared. Wow, I didn't realize, you know, so we can alter that um, quite a bit. So we need to tell the parents as we're walking them over to the kids, because it always should be one at a time, uh, some of those skills. If we can, maybe even a sheet of paper, a quick sheet of paper, but most of the time you can't do that that fast. Um, so that's the oldest trick in the book, reuniting kids with their caregivers. Um, something terrible happens to us, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to call or go to our significant others um, and our family. We also need to provide facts and adaptive interpretations. Uh, this is really important that we um, are not telling them. So if we're in a lockdown and we're in the bathroom with these kids, we can't say, oh, everything's going to be okay. I'm sure it's all right. That is more like that psychological counter-transference transference. You are saying that because you it's making you feel better. What we want to say is, you know, I know that our school has plans for events like this. Remember all those drills we've done? And remember all those first responders, they know what they're doing too, and they're going to call more if they need more. And they will let us know when it's safe for us to leave. So just the facts, we're not making promises. Um, I can go in, but there's a lot more to this. <laughs> I'm gonna just give you a little bit of it. Okay. So psychological triage. So triage meaning to sort, to separate. So we want to make sure, we, we are outnumbered in schools. We adults are outnumbered by these kids. So we cannot treat every child. We cannot support them in the same way every, every single child. So we have to make sure we're making good choices using our time efficiently. Okay. So we also need to know that recovery is the norm. This is going to happen for most individuals. The exception most of the time are those that were most um, proximity wise, and we'll talk about that, but also those that had pre-existing psychopathology. So if you already have a child with attachment issues, uh, depression, anxiety, those are the kids that we really need to focus in on. So we should always know who in our school are those high-risk cases, no matter what. Um, okay. So we also can do a lot of harm. Um, as much as we all, teachers, psychologists, everyone in a school, we can cause so much more harm than we realize if we are offering our help when it's not needed, when it's not wanted, and also if we are providing it to individuals that don't, that are not highest on the priority list. So, um, if I required students to come and I went into their classroom and I said, okay, let's all talk about our crisis story. Where were you, what did you, well, the child that's doing just fine is all of a sudden being re-traumatized by all this they didn't, re they didn't know about this or that or that child or this story. Um, so that can happen and we're also telling them, you know, 
this students in this group or individually you're talking with them, they thought, I'm doing okay, yeah, that was scary, but I'm coping. Well, you're telling them you're not able to cope. You can't do this by yourself. And sending the message that you need help. Or you could even be um, seeing all these other kids that are upset that, oh, what's wrong with me? Why am I not as upset as them? And so you're questioning yourself. So it can do a lot of harm. So that non-maleficence is really important. Uh, so this is a, the graphic that actually really guides the uh, PREPARE model. The very first part is more about the um, understanding how much <coughs> intervention we should have. Is this a district level? Is it a school level? Is it just a classroom level crisis intervention? Uh, we want to know about the, it's the crisis event and then we have predictability, duration, predictability. So if we have a teacher that is ill and then passes away, we knew somewhat about this predictability. We knew it may be coming. Um, that is less traumatic than something that happens suddenly without any warning. Okay? And then the duration, consequences, and intensity. I'm going to draw your attention more to these risk factors because this is what we're going to talk about with post function. Um, so we'll talk about exposure, the perceptions, and then the vulnerabilities in each of these. All right, so the risk factors. Proximity, um, physical proximity is actually the strongest predictor of crisis response over emotional proximity. Okay. So we have our physical proximity. Uh, where were they when this happened? What did they hear? What did they see? What did they smell? Did they taste the smoke in the air? What experience did they have? Okay. And then that is very, very important to developing our triage list, like who are these individuals that we need to really focus in on, give caregiver trainings. The next is the emotional proximity. Were you close to the victim? Did you, and a lot of this we had to kind of put that detective hat on. We don't always know, especially in high school, who's had relationships, who's secretly seeing each other, whose moms are best friends and they travel together but are not friends at school. We just don't know all that, and so we have to ask lots and lots of questions. And it's the job of everyone in the school to kind of have this incident command system in which, okay, I'm going to tell this person. They will take that information and will respond accordingly. Okay. All right, so threat perception. This is subjective. Um, all of us could experience something right now, and our threat perception is different. Some of us will be terrified and feel like our life was in danger. Some of us are, oh, that was scary, but it's okay. Uh, that perception is key in understanding how we need to intervene. Those with personal vulnerabilities, you know, we all have our little baggage with us, that is going to also indicate, um, help us understand how much uh, intervention they need. Um, our adult reactions actually impact their understanding of the threat. So it's that social contagion, the emotional contagion and social referencing. So, you know, child falls, skins their knee, they're gonna look up, oh, should I be crying? My hurt. They're going to do the same thing. Is this something I should worry about? The younger kids do this a little bit more than the older kids. They will respond to what their peers are doing a bit more. All right. Um, so this is a bit. This is a bit longer. So the crisis reaction warning signs. So the early warning signs are often adaptive. They're protective. We sometimes kind of zone out as a protective measure, right? If something happens. Oh. We can't hear things, we're just like a little nervous and kind of walking in a, our own little world. Sometimes those are just protective. But the early warning signs uh, can be, you know, the fear, the anxiety, the nervousness, the attachment. Um, but the enduring warning signs are what we really need to worry about. So these are things that do not remit or uh, go away, lessen within about a week. We know everyone will be forever changed. But when we have, we know recovery is the norm. If there's someone the first day after a crisis, they're not sleeping, they're not eating, uh, they are very irritable, if that just increases or does not get incrementally better, then those are the students that we also need to watch out for. That's why we have to talk to parents about signs and what to look for. Um, developmental variations, there are a lot of them. Um, so when we have the same crisis occurring to elementary kids and High school kids, we have our elementary kids, some of the things that can happen are um, regression in skills that they've already had. 
Um, they might start to bed wet. They might have nightmares. They are at their attachment clingy. Um, they're, they're a little different than the high schoolers. So many times with the high schoolers, things that we really need to focus in on are um, their coping strategies. What are they doing? Are they self-medicating? Um, also, do they have revenge fantasies? Um, so this is really dangerous. If you ever catch wind of someone thinking, I'm gonna get back at them, or I'm gonna get back at their friends or their family, whatever it may be, those we really have to pay attention to. Um, also self-harm, so cutting, mutilation, doing risky behaviors, that's another common. Um, and then also, adolescents are gonna be more oppositional and aggressive. And why, does anyone know why they may do this right after a crisis? Why would they be more oppositional than typical? Guilt. Guilt, okay. Survivor guilt, yeah. Do they have control over what happens? This is a way for them to have some control, okay? so. I'm not going to do what you said because I'm going to actually have some control over this life that you know everything is going on around me. So that's one of the ways as well. Um, with cultural variations, we have to uh, consider having a cultural broker. So whatever school you're in, look at who is in my school. Consider all those cultures, the ethnicities, the races, the belief systems. How do they understand death? How do what do they do after death? Um, we need to make sure we know the taboos. Uh, we don't want to overstuff. Some do not get uh, or are very resistant to any emotional, psychological, mental health, and we have to be very respectful of that. Um, but we also have to make sure we have these like memorandums of understanding with those that they do feel comfortable with to bring them in so that they can get the support that they choose. All right. Um, so. The next step is reestablishing those social supports. Uh, so we talked about a little bit of them. So reuniting parents with caregivers. Um, very important with that reunification plan I talked about. Strategy two is reuniting them with their peers and teachers. Okay? So a sense of normalcy. Life will go on. I have this. I know what's going to happen next because everything else is out of control. But knowing I have art class, then I have music, then I go back, all of those things really help with the coping from a trauma. Um, but there's been a study actually about, uh, we know that the older a child gets, the more likely they're going to seek out their peers as opposed to their parents, and parents won't always like this, um, because they want to be the one, and so we have to teach parents that as well. Like, they're going to seek the, those peers out. Um, they found that in one study, Eighth graders were twice as likely to seek out a peer than they were to their to seek out their parent. Okay, and so if we know this, it can teach the parents and not make and not have the parents. Well, talk to me about it. You know, we have to train the the parents as well. Um, so, what are some things we can do? We can have open gym. We can have open up the school ahead of time um, to give them places where they can meet in a safe place. It's our job to monitor that heavily to see what is going on. We don't have to be at every table, but we need to make sure that we are looking for those crisis reactions because triage changes. And you know we have to adjust with what we see. Okay. Um, we want to return them back to their typical environments, their routines, if it's a safe place. We want to kind of dismantle that classically conditioned idea of this is what happened there. That's what happened in the library. As soon as the sooner we do that, the easier it will be for them to have new memories and the old memories back, not just that um, crisis related memory. All right, uh, and then providing information. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more about psychoeducation. Oh my gosh. All right, and I will get to that. All right, so the next steps. Uh, psychological and then the psychoeducation. Um, I want you to walk away with just at least one strategy. I mean, there are, there are a lot of strategies, but one thing you can do with a child, uh, just something in your tool, tool chest. So psychological interventions. Uh, many of you have already been in a school, and for whatever reason, crisis related or not, you need to, you see an emotionally overwhelmed child, okay? Um, usually happens in the bathroom. 
So you go into the bathroom or you hear somebody in the bathroom, they're crying. Um, you go into the bathroom and you need to respond to them immediately. Um, so the crisis state, this is a time in which they are upset, they're disorganized, they have no, they might have coping skills, but they are not using them that way. And they are stuck, it's like deer in the headlights, um, and the inability to cope. So one of the strategies is grounding a student that is really just kind of, you've probably seen it like where they're looking kind of through you or across from you. They are not within this world, they are in their head. This is a way for us to bring them back to the world and take them out of just their head. Okay. So some techniques for grounding. Yeah. Um, so let's say we see that child in the bathroom. So we go, we sit down with them. You're not going to move them. That's going to be more difficult too. So you just stay where they are. You ask the child to look and listen. Okay. Look at you. Can you look at me? And then just, you know, having that and understanding their sound coming out of the mouth. I mean, just some of that, like, getting out into that real world. Um, asking them to sit in a comfortable position, and you do that too. So if they're all scrunched up, which they usually are, we want them to have their legs, their arms out, um, just so that they're not restricting their own blood flow. Um, sorry, hyperventilate. We want to teach them how to do that breathing in slowly, deeply. You do it with them. You might count. You can do the counting, the... You know, there's a lot of different strategies. Um, and then, this is part of that grounding too. You ask them to look around and name five objects they see. Okay, so they're probably still in their own, you know, in their head. What do you see? Okay, for the littler kids, we might say, can you find things, can you find something that's red? Can you name five colors you see? Okay, so that's, again, they're out, getting out of their head to be able to know what's happening in their own world. Um, asking what sounds can you hear right now? No, that's not one you should do when there's ambulances and sirens. This is this can be something that, you know, the children come back the day after. All of those things are gone, but they are still in this crisis state. Um, what can you feel? Uh, you can provide examples and do this uh, with them. So this is immediate. You have to do this. Um, and then eventually you can maybe take this child to a safer place and obviously monitor them <laughs> and talk to parents. Um, this is someone that is high on your triage list. Okay? And it can happen a week later, two weeks later. We have to really be attentive. Okay? All right, so psychoeducation. Uh, so the term psychoeducation is essentially I'm teaching you how to cope or I'm teaching you how to help your child cope. Okay, so it's education, psychoeducation. So the first strategy is information, flyers, bulletins. We all know that the schools, they should have a system in place in which all the information is given to the parents in the same way, same language, verified, verified, verified facts, so they all get the same thing. Uh, within a classroom, it can be a small little piece of paper that every teacher is given, and they have to read the paper and it's like one paragraph, and it's about there was something sad that happened today, Johnny, da 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 da, or whatever it may be. If there's a death in the school um, this during this time, and you can talk about some typical crisis reactions, and then also who can you talk to during that time? Um, we also need to pay attention to um, what the responses are. There's lots of different letters and different things that you can see uh, on this resource as well. Um, the next is caregiver training. So this is where probably won't happen that very first day, but it could happen the day after, the day after. Uh, we bring in parents that are interested, probably of not the most absolute effective, like the highest list on the priority, because they're going to they're going to need different intervention. Um, but during this time, we tell the parents the facts so that we can dispel rumors, because the rumors are um, just crazy, and we have to make sure that. They know that. We also need to let them know what are the common reactions you're going to see. Your kids are going to be irritated. They're not going to want to always talk to you. We want to tell them what to expect and to also not be angry when the children respond in that way. Also, not to be surprised. Like, oh, we can't, you know, that's not helpful. We all know this if somebody's trying to help you. Uh, we also want to establish the um, typical coping behaviors, also letting them know what do you need to do 
um, what are you looking for, and how to ask for help and get referrals. Okay, so it's in a nutshell. Um, these caregiver trainings, I've done them, they're usually an hour, an hour and a half. The next is a classroom meeting. So um, I think I mentioned you know, having a sheet of paper, this is what happened, looking at the reactions. Does anyone have questions? Your responses should be, um, these are the facts I know, ask your parents, or we don't know yet. Okay, so it's very clear, no speculation. It's really hard for us teachers to not continue to talk, right? Um, we like to do that. And then we have the student psychoeducational group. These are students that are selected that have had similar crisis experiences. Um, and what we do is we want to make sure they have coping strategies. That's the key difference here. Um, what do they, they should maybe leave with a little piece of paper that says, these are the three people I'm going to contact if I'm feeling overwhelmed. These are places I can go. Um, these are things I can do. I like to read books. I like to um, go online and look at this. Whatever it is that they like, it has to be individualized so we can walk them through what they do if they are alone and need someone. Um, in addition, other, other areas to manage stress, breathing techniques and such. Did you see that? I was going to create a few steps. <laughs> All right, so memorials. This is very important. Um, I actually, we will be giving you, we can send it out and actually maybe post it online, uh, some of the resources as to what things to do in memorials. And in addition to like how to talk, how can teachers talk to kids about violence, um, but memorials are very important. We need to make sure that we have policies governing these uh, because we don't want them to be inconsistent. We don't want the very popular football player to have this big memorial and then the other child who was um, not well known, same thing happened, um, not have the same uh, reaction. It's not equitable. It shows different messages. Um, so we have to have those policies in place. And those policies should be through a committee. We also have, um, we also have differences for suicide, death by suicide, and then other types of deaths, for example. Uh, so if we have a death by suicide, we need to make sure that we don't have any permanent or even semi-permanent memorials. Uh, no big pages in the yearbook. Uh, these can be, we don't want to glorify it in any way. Uh, we can have more of the living memorials, which kind of promote life. Um, so fundraisers, 5Ks, things that have an end date as well. They're not continuous. Um, a fundraiser to get money for bullying or suicide prevention, something along those lines. Um, also, we need to monitor all these memorial sites. These can be places in which we're going to find other um, individuals actually kind of re-experiencing or going to during an anniversary of the event, or birthday, or graduation, some of those times. And then, monitoring, yeah, I think that's about it. Lastly, like any good teacher, anyone in a school, you have to evaluate what you've done, what worked, where were your gaps, where was there miscommunication. You have to survey those teachers, do focus groups with parents, with kids. Um, this is very abbreviated, but I'm more than happy to talk to anyone about ways in which we can, you know, work with your classes and, and such. Okay, so that, we got to the final steps. Okay, so any questions? I'm not sure what time it is. Uh, we are uh, like one, one minute. So thank you so much for coming today. We talked about prevention. We talked about intervention. There are very, um, there are a lot of uh, training modules and professional development modules that we can do on, on both ends of this. And we would encourage, we would really like to encourage uh, faculty and staff to, to 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 get both ends of the of the picture. Um, over the next year, um, our uh, dean has said that we're going to be focusing on. Want, want to go ahead and say it? Well, we're thinking what we can do as a school throughout next year to deal with issues of um, guns, and gun violence, and school safety. Um, so we're already having discussions with the School of Social Work about the major conference in the fall. Um, I want to thank Steve, and I want to thank Megan, and all of our faculty who want to help us with that. So um, tremendously, tremendously um, hard 
thing to deal with, but we're going to try our best to bring this to life and, and, and do more work on this. But again, thank you for starting us with this. Yeah, thanks. So as far as we're concerned, enough is enough. We have a lot of it. The Carolina community has so many resources, so many support. We have folks like yourself who were, who were launching out to do good things. We want to give you some tools to do those good things in a way that um, we can really um, um, impact this just this ongoing national tragedy. Um, and the whole, and we've tried to share with you some hopeful things as well as the kind of really um, difficult things today. Um, Sam and I are both available to meet with with your students, as classes, the faculty, and next year we're really hoping. Um, as the Dean said, to take us to the next level with others in, in the school. All right, folks, it's the first day of spring. It's